Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I am your host, Lisa Woolford, and I am so happy to be able to introduce to you today, Drew Christine Thompson, who is a wonderful, fantastic maker, sewing teacher, instructor, designer, organizer, and (laughs) manager, and resource maker, right? So you think you're looking at one person, but you are looking at one person that wears about 5011 hats. She just don't have them on all right now because she's got them gorgeous earrings on. <laughs> so let me tell you, um, we had to take a five minute break before we started today, good friends, because I had not had my coffee yet. So I said, oh, wait, Drew, hold on one second. Let me let's come, let's meet back in five minutes. Man, sis came back. She had the earrings. She had, I was <laughs> like, what? Now I, gotta, I gotta go change. What? Yeah. I had to catch up. So listen, y'all, if you are a Patreon supporter, you will be watching this video a day ahead or so from our episode. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, why are you not? The low is $2 a month. Clearly, I am worth more than $2 a month. And you know this, man. So I am so happy to get started talking with you, Drew, because Drew has a philosophy, a true mission to teach people to sew. And I am grateful for it. I am so grateful for it because we all want sewing to thrive. We want the next generation to be able to do what we do now. And uh, I, Lisa, me, do not want to teach anybody how to sew. I find it annoying and really a long and painful process. So Mm -hmm. I am happy that there are folks like you in our community who are delighted to do it. Welcome to the program, Drew. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Excited. Thank you. So, Drew, can you tell us the beginning of your sewing story? Where did you get started? How did you come to sewing? Oh, man. So I was a very, I'll say active child. I don't like to say bad child. You know, I was just very energetic. So I got put on punishment a lot. So no phone, no TV. Obviously, there was no cable and all that. Right. But for some reason, the sewing machine was still hanging around because my mother sews, my sister sews. My sister sews way better than me, actually. She just doesn't want no parts. And I just started messing with the sewing machine. So I started taking my mother's <laughs> sheets and whatever. And then she started taking me to the fabric store. And it started from there. So I've been sewing probably since I was 13. I'll be 49 this month. So happy um, birthday. Sewing, yeah, thank you. So yeah, sewing, for sewing a little bit of time, for a little bit of time. My goodness. I'm just amazed that all the energy all of the things that might land you on punishment ended up opening a door to a career for you. Mm -hmm. Did you take to sewing right away? Because 13 year old Lisa, when she was on punishment was not enthusiastic about sewing anything. I would be surly and I'd be like reading books really mad in my room. Right, right, right. So like, what were you doing? You were like, oh, I'm on punishment. I'm gonna make a handbag. Like what? I just, um, I was always really creative. So I was drawing, I would be making lotions and sending them to my friends. I was always doing something. So this wow. was probably, I'm so glad my son isn't like how I was. I know I draw my parents crazy. I was always doing something, always doing something. So someone was just, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. What was the first thing you made? Do you remember your very first project? The first thing you made? No, nah, I'm sure it was some Barbie clothes, I'm sure. But I don't remember. I have to ask my mother. She probably remembers. Oh my gosh. I don't remember. Now that was the 13 year old you. And now you are the grown adult you. And you have this mission to teach people to sew. How do you take your love of sewing, the things that you love about sewing and give them to somebody else? So I guess maybe the first question is, what is it about sewing compared to all the other things that you did at the time, like the, you know, drawing and all the other things? What is it about sewing and design work that appeals to you. So the whole concept of taking something flat and then making it to be able to fit your body is still just like, wow. 
You know, it's like you start with something flat. You got to do all this stuff to it. I mean, my background is fashion design, too. So I did go to school for fashion design. Ended up getting a degree in merchandising, which is obviously the better skill that I need. So, yeah, just the whole concept of being able to take something and put it on your body. That was just it's still very fascinating to me, even now. They're very fascinating. And so during your training in fashion design school, what kind of skills do you remember like practicing that you found like revelatory? Like, oh, that's interesting. Or I didn't know that was the way to do it. I always imagine fashion school. When anybody says they've gone to fashion school, I imagine it being like a combination of that show Fame from the 80s where they yep. kids <laughs> dancing on top of the cafeteria tables because they were dancing and people would break out violins at lunch and they'd be having concerts. I imagine that being like that, but with sewing machines and people walk around with their sewing machines and then they sit down and they make something real fast and then they throw up a fashion show in the cafeteria. I know that's probably not how any fashion school actually works, but just let me have my my illusions. Throw in a little bit of hazing. (laughs) Oh my gosh. What? Hazing? Oh yeah. Like you had critiques. I mean, like Project Runway, how they stand up there. We had critiques and we had... Yeah, it was it was no dance. It was a lot of crying, probably. It was no, you know, but wow. what I did learn was the marketability piece. I learned about, you know, the business part of it. Like, we think all these fabulous ideas come up and they already know what we're wearing two or three years from now. So I learned about that. I learned about the business of fashion. I really took to costume and history of fashion. I really, really enjoyed that. And then just when I designed and showed, I learned about just making your fashion designs look cohesive. So what does that mean? What does a cohesive design mean? So for you hear them saying on project, I don't watch project running anymore, but like, say, for example, you have on that beautiful fabric, right? So cohesion would be a dress out of that fabric. And then maybe somebody would do a pair of pants out of that fabric, a hat, and just a cold color combination. So it looks like a collection as opposed to you might see street designers and they got a black shirt, a red shirt, green pants. I like this. I like that. So what I found was after I finished fashion school or, you know, my training as a designer, I went to do back to Cleveland doing these shows and my collections look completely different than everybody else's because I'm formally trained, you know? Oh. And so that was a skill I learned. And I still, even today, as I'm merchandising stuff, I'm always thinking about color combinations and how it tells a story. So that was a, that was a profitable skill. Not sure if it was worth the money, <laughs> but I did learn that. So, oh my word. I appreciate how you're bringing that forward and like looking at some of the most recent work that you've done like with the mix of the skirts and the bows and like and it seems as though any shirt could go with it because you have that cohesion from the the top to the bottom. So is that mm-hmm. how cohesion works? Does it have to be some kind of like is it a vertical thing that you could look at a person and say what that is or is it something else is it something different it could be a detail it could be fabric so a lot of people look at my stuff and they know it's mine because I got all those bowls if you look at my collections it's just really the same silhouette over and over I just change it up so cohesion could be anything but it's just as long as it's able to look at the collection and know it's all the same thing even when you look at collections on the runway you can pick out the themes you know, if you look at the first five or six garments, you could pick out what the theme is. So. Do you have a favorite fabric to work with? Do you have like a fabric type or style that you're like, oh, if I'm in like a, a mood and I'm not sure I want to do, if I pick up this fabric, I'll know that I'll be good. Or is that not how you get motivated to design a piece? What comes to you first? Is it like, fabric? Is it color? Is it mood? Like, how do you decide? Like, I always wonder that, like, how does a designer decide what they're going to put together? If they're crazy enough, it's not one thing. So it's like, it could be anything. So it could be music. It could be fabric. I'm still looking at this, your shirt. It could be, I mean, it could be anything. (laughs) So yeah, it could be anything. I mean, I know that's not a good answer, but... Oh, but hey, that's people, a great answer. That's your answer. Yeah, that's the right answer. Yeah, it's, it could be... I could see a leaf and be like, oh, I want to do... It could be anything. Oh, my word. Yeah. I mean, the artist brain is like 20 tabs open at all times. and Oh, just, wow. That's a great metaphor. That's a great metaphor. I mean, that's most women, but mo- yeah. We are, and my sister says, I've never met anybody that's always thinking. She talks to me, so I'm, I'm always like... Hmm. 
Hmm. <laughs> it's like, good morning, Drew. How are you thinking? Da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I love it. I love it. Do the tabs in your mind help you keep track of it all? Do you ever lose an idea? I sometimes worry that I do. Oh, yeah. My sister laughs at me. She said, if you ever commit a crime, I know you have a notebook somewhere that you wrote it down. Ooh. I mean, I have notebooks and I just, I just go. And the phone doesn't do it. You have to write it. So I love that. I lose ideas. I lose them, especially when I'm getting older. <laughs> sure, yes. I lose. Yes. Yeah. I love that idea that you keep that notebook nearby. That is so smart so that you can put it down and you know it's not gone. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, it's here. It's somewhere. And yeah. now I can yeah. release it. I can close this tab in my mind because I got it here in this book. Right. I love that. I wanted to see if we could talk a bit about some of the custom work that you do, which is, I always find custom sewing Talk about hazing. That's yeah. what I think of as custom abuse. Like, abuse. I abuse. have a good enough time trying to get it to fit my body right, let alone any and everybody that walks through the door. Is that an extension also of your like merchandising vision, of your vision? Like what motivated you and kept you going with the custom sewing, which feels like so challenging? Uh, so I think I started making clothes for people when I was 19. Mm-hmm. I mean, money is always, you know, the motivation. We used to have these things in Cleveland called hair shows. I'm sure they have them all over. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, our scene was huge. And I'm 19 and people are coming to me like, I need eight outfits in a week. Whoa. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and they got this big wad of cash and I'm, you know, I'm getting it done. But it was fantasy. It was fun. You know, it was throwaway stuff. You know, I didn't have no surgery. And then I was doing, I don't, I don't even want to look at some of that stuff. And then it just moved towards people just, you know, kept calling and kept calling. And and I keep telling people, like, I'm not doing prom. And they keep calling and calling. So now after the pandemic, now what we have to realize is service, we, it's kind of a, we're kind of helping people. Like everybody's still just in this weird state. They're playing these events. They're anxious. They don't know what's going on. Right. So they want to feel normal to some degree. And some people want to come get a dress made. And believe it or not, it's, you become a counselor, really, through this whole process. I believe it. Say more about that. When someone comes to you and say, I want a dress made, how is that like counseling in some way? Well, you get people who, you know, insecure about their shape, or they'll come in and say, hey, I just lost my whatever, my husband, and I want to get something made for my birthday. I mean, the prom dynamics alone. So you got mothers and daughters. Oh. Honey, you already know. It's like the daughter is going in. And mom is just like, I want a plunging neckline down to my belly button. And I also wanted to do the same thing in the back. And I just look at the mom. I stop drawing. I just look at the mom. And then she'll say, to the point now with the girls, if they talk to their mother, I say, you have to stop talking to your mom like that. I can't take that. Wow. Because some of those kids talk to their mom so bad. It's really. So yeah, you become, and then I guess auntie, counselor. Yeah. You know, and then it gets to. What shoes should I wear? And they text me pictures of their shoes. They ask me about hair. So it's all this. And then after they get the outfit, you don't hear from them again. And then we just start, <laughs> we started all over again. I'm like, thanks for paying the invoice. I wouldn't mind a picture if you had a minute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God for social media because now I get, but I used to have to put an envelope, stamped envelope in the prom outfit so they could mail me back a picture because they would get that dress and be gone, you know? Wow. And in some ways, that's a great sign of your success as well, right? That you got them from the idea stage to and the, the discomfort stage that I don't know about my body, I don't feel comfortable or whatever, to feeling like, hey, this is how it always was, right? I'm, right. I'm happy, I'm proud, I'm delighted, and I forgot who got me to this point. Goodbye. No, nope. like, yeah, forget <laughs> her. I'm, this is mine, you know, I'm gone. So when you said you started making clothes for people at 19, That was before you started fashion design school? Yeah. So you were already building runway collections because you worked with hair shows. And Mm -hmm. for all who don't know what a hair show is or how a hair show works, it is theater. Yes, ma'am. It was so fun, though. It is drama. It is the stuff like... Again, this is a show for this show centers black women, girls, and femmes in sewing. So the people that we're talking to know what we're talking about. Yeah, it was um, so fun. But so fun. The drama, the stuff that you're like, wait, that's somebody's hair. <laughs> 
And Somebody got a bird, a bird cage a in bird cage. with a bird. With a bird. The, yeah. the, I mean, it was just so fun. Yes, it was exactly. so fun. It's bells. It could be like bells. And so when you walk down at bells, right? Like all type of stuff. It's sculpture. It's sculpture. It's, mm-hmm. it's like, and the garments become like part of the canvas for the overall art, you mm-hmm. know? And you putting up eight of them in a week, like, okay, real quick. And then of course, because you're 19, you're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you oh, you giving me some money? Oh, you guys did that money? Because you know, hair hair people get paid. They have cash. So they're coming. Yes. Yes. They're like, like, how much I mean, you need for fabric? And how much you need for here you go? Here. Is this enough? Right, right. Yeah, it was, it was cool. It was um, so those were every probably every other week. And to me, if you want to learn how to sew and fast, that was it. So I forgot what the question was, but yeah. So <laughs> well, no, I, I'm so glad we took this turn because here what I'm thinking about is you as a 19-year-old with substantial experience in sewing under high pressure situations, right? Of meeting the expectation of artists who have a specific vision for what they want, right? Because the hairstylists that are paying you to do these outfits want them to look a certain way. I'm Mm -hmm. thinking about you as a 19 year old taking all that skill and information and then going to fashion school. It was bad. Like, that's what I wanted to ask about. Like, what, what did it mean to kind of translate your organic knowledge the stuff that you had built up through your own year. You already had, you came into school with six years of practice, right? In a business. I went to college with a business. And it was, um, <laughs> I laugh about it now because as an African-American, it was probably, what, four, it was four of us in my fashion school. And the problem I always had was, you know, who you think you are? I think I'm Drew Christine. That's what I think who I am. Yeah, but what? it was like, I guess in hindsight, I could have been a little bit more quiet. I mean, you know, but that why? is, not as me but girl please it was funny because I had to take they made me take sewing my first year oh and my father laughed yeah I didn't get I didn't get to test out which it was a joke and I got a C (laughs) (laughs) that was a seasoning you know put me in my place hey friends hey what are you doing on Thursday around 3 p.m. or so You got 30 minutes to hang out with Black Women's Stitch? You got 60? If so, come through for 30-Minute Thursdays. Thursdays, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can chill with Black Women's Stitch on Instagram Live or talk with us through the two-way audio on Clubhouse at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's Thursdays for 30 minutes. Come hang out, chill, and have fun with us. See you Thursday. That's the hazing you mentioned. So he you've been sewing for six years. They forced you to take a sewing class in fashion design school. And you were like, how did you end up with a C? Was that just cruel? I don't know. Were there techniques that you didn't know how to do? Like, I don't know. One opportunity I think the school missed was teaching kids how to be entrepreneurs instead of working for somebody. So we got to school. I got to school with a business already. (laughs) And we went off and made our own organization, a whole different minority fashion organization. We were doing fashion shows because it was me. I was like six of us that had our own fashion lines coming to school. Wow. And these were all students of color. These were all black and brown students that had. It was called Fashion Association of Diverse Students. So we was just going off doing our own thing. We was going to CFDA awards. Wow. We were doing all type of stuff. And that's the opportunity I think the school missed. So fast forward now, I got called maybe about three or four years ago to come down there to speak. Now they have an entrepreneurship program. I said, are you kidding me? Wow. I said, we would be millionaires by now if they had that when we were it, in school. Wow. And I, la- I said, Ma, guess who want me to come speak? I said, Kent. She said, what? I didn't graduate from Kent. I ended up graduating from University of Akron. So that's a whole nother story. But yeah, so we were ahead again, trend setting as usual, right? And by decades, by actual decades. And isn't it funny that the thing that they gave you a hard time about when you started 30 years ago, right? They gave you grief about that. Now they want you to come back Mm -hmm. and be an example of it. Like, you know, I'll come back for this honorarium and for a revision of this great right. transcript because it's... Oh, girl. I mean, but it's funny because a lot of the professors after that, they speak to me now or they, you know, they're cool. 
I even had one of my drawing teacher walk into my studio one day. She didn't know it was my studio. And I had a flashback. I was like, ah! <laughs> Run! Be, save yourselves! Right. And she's like, is this your shop? I said, yes, it is. Yep, sure is. Remember that D you gave me, y'all? Mm-hmm. Ooh, is it? But I digress. You know what they say? Living well is the best revenge. Yep, yep, it is. So... I'm grateful. I just always shake myself about the situations and the places I end up because of my art, but I'm always grateful, you know. And what I love about your story is that it is so you and it reminds us that we should and can bet on ourselves. Oh yeah, keep going. Cause I'm, oh we, <laughs> that you getting the cliff notes, but yeah. And how that betting on yourself has now turned into an expansion. So not only do you have a studio and a business that your former professors can walk into and marvel at, you are growing that. So talk about that. Like what, how do you know when it's time for an enterprise to expand? Like what was the signal that you were like, okay, I think we're going to need to do a little bit more. We need more room. How do you know when it's time? You mean, how do I go from my home business to my business or from the business to more business which one both first how do you go from the home business to the now I have a shop that I'm paying like rent and lights and everything for then how do you decide okay I'm doing this and now I'm going to do more of it but it seems like that what was the I think the hardest step to me as an outsider sounds like going from a home business to a more like formal outside type thing but you had the experience what do you think so I was married. I had a, one of the prerequisites for our buying our house was I need this space to the back of the house so I can have clients. So we had a home, but we had like a little, like a den. It was perfect. I made it a studio. Yeah. People could not have to come through my house. They would come to my back door. Yes. Do what they had to do. We kept doing that. I mean, yeah. So I guess maybe, I don't even know, maybe 10 years I did that in both of my places. And then we, I got divorced. I was going through a divorce. And as I'm going through a divorce, I lost my job. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, all right, God, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And I still had people calling, and I think my car was about to get repossessed or something. Oh. And I said, God, if you just let me get this money for this car, I will just, I don't even know, you know, one of these Hail Mary prayers. Yes. And I think three people came that day, pay cash. Whoa. And I was like, oh, shoot, I got this money. I'm about to go to pay this car note and then go to Nordstrom's. God said, no, <laughs> yeah, I had just enough money to pay the car note and like a Subway sandwich. I said, okay, I'll go get the sandwich. So that kind of signaled me that this is what I should be doing. And the cool part about it was, you know how we have our fabric. I had fabric in the basement. Yes. So I was trying to figure out how I can deal with customers, not spend that much money. So I started, they asked for something. I would bring some of my fabrics out from the basement and show, say, hey, And they would pick from there. And I said, this could be a business. This is, you know, because of the whole concept of somebody feeling like they custom picked everything. Yes, yes, yes. I don't even know when I've decided to go get a key. I just remember having a key. I don't remember what took, I don't remember. I know I told my sister, I'm going to get a space. And then next thing I know, I was like, I got the space, but I don't know what happened. Wow. So I just know I was floating on my ancestors, you know, because I don't even know, I don't remember. When I thought of it, I just was doing it. So. Yes. Oh my God. Floating on your ancestors. I, I Somebody was carrying me because I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember. That is amazing. I love it because it shows that that is so thoroughly integrated into who you are and how you do you and how Drew puts Drew's spin on it. And it's a process that nobody else could follow right? Because it was just something that was for you. Like they say, what God has for you is for you, you know? And like, that's what you are telling us. And so I really, really appreciate the way that you carved out space in your home to keep it separate. Mm -hmm. But you started to realize that, you know, I could keep it very separate by having a space that's completely different. And next thing you know, you got a key. So now you've got the key, you've got the space, It's this wonderful studio. People are coming in to learn to sew and doing custom work and all of these things. And you are having such a great impact in your community. Mm. How do you then decide to say, okay, it's time to do this, but more. 
Like, what was that decision like to get you to the point where we are going to expand? So you could thank COVID, basically. Mm. Of course, we talked about masks. I was making masks and I was like, wait a minute. I don't want to be competing with these 12 year olds making masks. I got to figure <laughs> figure something out. <laughs> so I started selling the not the masks. I started selling mask kits and fabric and interfacing and elastic. I still got elastic, elastic. So I started not necessarily only taking them as my competitors, making them my customers. Yes. Because you think about it, people were standing like going to Joanne's three or four hours. Yes. And you could just come to my shop and I'm going to run it outside, you know? Right. That's right. I think then when the Aurora opened back up slightly, our song class just exploded. I mean, I had this class called Weekend Warrior and I started having it every month. And every month it sold out Wow. for a year. I mean, just, wow. it was crazy. And so we were having it outside my studio. My studio people let me have it in the hallway. So we was having like six and eight people. We had to spread out. Wow. Yes, yes. So we just kept having the class. I got burned out on it probably about May. And I was like, I'm not doing this. Because the people were getting weird. I was like, we're going to go back to having this every other month. Not, it was getting too weird. Yeah. But the summer classes, I mean, I'm talking about private lessons. It picked up. So my studio, I didn't think it was a problem. I thought it was fine. My, my system was like, yeah, it is kind of packed in here. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and <laughs> there's a space next to me and I wanted it, but I was scared. I was like, I don't know. We still in the pandemic. I was like, I don't know if I'm be able to, I don't, cause you know, everything is still very uncertain. It was like, eh. yes. So somebody else went over there and then one day I got to work and he came and got on my studio said, Hey, if you want to have your class in this other space, you can, because they're gone. And I'm like, what? Uh-oh. They're gone. I said, okay. So I'm thinking like, okay, I'm going to just have my class. And then something was like, no, you need to find out how much that space is and get it. Yeah. You know, when you're sewing, you can't have noise next to you. Right. So that was always my thing. My st- I can't have people next to me making noise because I would never get anything done. Right. So I don't know. Next day I know I got, I got the other space. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I said, I said, okay. I said, okay, God. If I make X, Y, Z amount of money in this amount of time, then I know that's the answer. And that money came through probably like in six hours. Oh, my word. Look at that. And I was like, all right. Okay. I mean, so I take things and they have to really fall on me for me to know it's for me. I don't go seek out stuff. I wait for it to come to me. Yeah. That works better for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Oh yeah. my, I love that. This, oh my goodness, Drew, this is so wonderful. I am so happy for all of your growth, all of your flourishing, all the things that you are doing. It's just so wonderful. It's abundance, right? Like it's an overflow. You've got overflow. But people need to know it's not easy. I work my, I mean, I took off a week. I work my, like, no, but you know, people have been grateful, but people think it's easier. They see, you know, and I'm like, you don't know what I had to, I mean, this is on the turn of a divorce and a lost family, which is, you know, not happy. Yeah. You know, people think they look at something and see it's one way. No, I had to, I mean, I literally remember going to the bank with my money from my settlement and the lady was like, what do you want to do today? And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) and that's when the bank teller becomes the counselor, just like you, the counselor for the the girls that come through for girl. I remember just falling. I mean, cause she was like, what, how can I help you today? I mean, cause I got this check in my, that's how they do. You get a divorce, they give you this check and it's like, damn, this is the, my life. This is it. You know, this, this is my, my, this right. Paper. That's how I feel. It's just, a, it's like, damn, this is okay. That's 30, 20 years. All right. Down the grain. So, oh. so people have to realize that. And I work, I work hard. I work a lot. It's not easy. Yes. You put in the time and there's certain things that are incalculable, you know, like the grief and the loss, the things that have helped to also motivate you, that this mm-hmm. also is part of your journey. And I think a lot of people see the finish line and think, oh, wow, she just crossed the finish line. Good for her. That was easy. And they don't see all the millions and millions of steps in the years of sacrifice and missed things and missed opportunities and, you know, borrowed yeah. Peter to pay Paul and all of that. Woo, child. I'm sitting here now like, oh, I took this time off. I need some money. <laughs> I need some money. <sighs> you got some money? I asked my dog if he got some money. He don't <laughs> have no. <none. laughs> Oh my goodness. Drew, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I'm so thankful to speak with you today. 
Let me ask you, I've been asking folks about this. The slogan of the Stitch Please podcast is, we will help you get your stitch together. And I'm going to ask you, what advice do you have for our listeners? And what is the phrase, how would you help somebody get their stitch together? What advice would you have to help them get their stitch together? So surprisingly, it's not about anything about creating. It's more about, I've been really on this journey of self-awareness and believing that you deserve things. So you have these people who want to learn how to sew or want to go into a business, any business, and you have to believe that you deserve it. So you that keeps you from undercharging. That keeps you from asking for what you deserve. I mean, you you got you deal with landlords. I'm a black woman dealing with male landlords. And I have to say to them, I need this fix. So if you self-awareness, believe you deserve whatever, that's the first step. I mean, it's not enough to do the sewing, unfortunately, but just believing and self-aware and honing in on your craft and making sure you're doing the best. And yeah. with the pandemic, we go in that extra mile for people. I've been doing more home deliveries than ever, which I do not do, but just to get that extra piece. So self-awareness, you know, a willingness to help. That's all I got. I love it. I love it. And I think that that self-awareness and telling yourself that you deserve it mm-hmm. is key to life. Not mm-hmm. just to sewing well, but to living well. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Drew, Christine Thompson, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been wonderful. I'm going to put all your social links in the show notes, but do you want to tell the folks where they can find you on the socials? I am on everything. I'm not on TikTok. My attention span can't. I can't. But I'm on uh, Facebook, Drew Christine Fabrics and Design. I'm on Twitter, Drew Christine. What's that thing? Instagram, Drew Christine. And my website, www.drewchristine.com. LinkedIn, Drew Thompson. So you just put in Drew Thompson or Drew Christine and I will pop up somewhere. Except, except TikTok. Except I can't TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> Thank you so much, Drew. This has been wonderful. Thank you. All right, cool. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really, really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcast directories or services allow for reviews, but for those who do, For those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments, if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the Stitch Please podcast, that is incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together. 